before uh, he's going to be presenting the lesson this morning. We're going to be reading from the, the book of Revelation. I'm going to be reading from the 12th chapter, verses 9 through to 12. Revelation chapter 9. And there was war in heaven, Michael and his angels waging war with the dragon. The dragon and his angels waged war. And they were not strong enough, and there was no longer a place found for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old who was called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, and Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come, for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, he who accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. For this reason, rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, knowing that he is only a short time. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that scripture reading, and I would encourage each one, if possible, to go ahead and open your Bible. Follow along with me in Revelation chapter 12. I, I think that the passages will appear on the screen behind me, but I also suggest that sometimes it's a benefit to see it right in your own hand in your own Bible. In the reading, there's scary stuff. There's angels waging war, dragons, serpent. Perhaps we're supposed to be scared. We ought to be frightened. Because the concept is something like there's somebody stalking you. And that's got to be a scary thing. Stalking you with evil intent. And the one stalking you is ugly and frightening. But the one stalking you might also be handsome and appear friendly. The one stalking you has the intention of taking your life and robbing you of your very soul. And if that's scary, it's intended to be. Because the reality is... And the one who is stalking you has folks or existences that help him, demons. He's got entities on his side. He's got a whole arsenal of tricks and secret weapons. And he lays traps with temptations and discouragements and things like revenge and anger and pride and peer pressure and loneliness. And all those things are laid out as traps. And of course, you know, the one stalking you, the one I'm talking about is Satan. And it is not your physical life that he's after. It's your eternal life. And so maybe we're not so frightened or scared because we don't see our eternal life. Sometimes we're not aware of it as we ought to be. But it ought to be frightening. It's dangerous. And we ought to understand, whether we like it or not, that each one of us is in a battle for our lives. And we need to win. We need to overcome Satan. And as I look at the writings in Revelation chapter 12, and the Apostle John is speaking here, and he speaks in the portion that was read today, of those who were victorious over Satan. And he reveals how they obtained their victory, how they overcame their adversary. And so 
following suit, it explains how we can obtain victory over Satan as well. And so I want to look primarily at verse 11, but we'll, we'll kind of deal with the whole section. The first principle in fighting an effective battle, I guess, uh, and not so much from this passage, but just in general, is to know that you're being attacked. If, if, I mean, you ought to be scared if Satan is prowling about like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. In order to win, in order to overcome Satan, we ought to realize that we're in a battle. And lots of times folks don't realize that yet. And some folks with some familiarity with Scripture even or Bible history that they get off of television or wherever, they think that the battle against Satan was fought and it was won a long time ago. And so all this battle and all this uh, uh, war waging in heaven and all this stuff we read about, that was in Bible times. And in a sense, that's true. Because in a sense, Christ fought the decisive battle. And Christ gained the victory already. But at the same time, it's also true that the battle continues to rage for your personal soul. And that battle rages for the souls of your loved ones. And it goes on every day for those who are still alive and for those who are yet to live. The enemy is Satan. Satan is a word that is translated as adversary. He's your opponent. He's your enemy, spiritually. He is the one who stands against you. Scripture also refers to him as the devil. That's a word that translates as slanderer. He goes around saying stuff about you. It's also translated... <clears throat> as the accuser, and we can see his role in this passage in making accusations. Sometimes this adversary takes the form of our own pursuit of our own lusts, James chapter 2. Uh, you know, we ponder on these things and we dwell on them long enough and sooner or later we yield to those temptations and when it bears fruit in sin and results in death. And so sometimes it's within us, and I'll grant that, but make no mistake, it's not only our own fleshly desires that are at work, because Satan is a living entity, very much active, and out there prowling about like a roaring lion, seeking to tempt you. 1 Thessalonians 2.18 uh, the apostle says, for we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. He's presenting that in one of many passages as an evil force out there at work. Sometimes he gets in our way. Sometimes he causes all kinds of problems. Sometimes he trips us up. Sometimes he catches us. And we need to be aware of his subtle and evil schemes. We need to be aware <clears throat> that the battle is raging and that the battle has many different stages. And so as we look at the spiritual warfare that's going on, it's sort of like looking through a telescope or a microscope and, you know, you can look at something with your naked eye and see some things in general and then you turn it up to 10 times the power and you see more specifics and then you turn it up to 100x and you see all kinds of other things with more specificity. Sometimes you can look and you can see that this is a theological battle. It goes on in the heavenlies. But as you adjust your scope and you look at it, you see worldwide advances of evil, like anti-Christian terrorist groups worldwide, like false religions that portray themselves as Christians, but they're not really proclaiming the gospel. And then you turn your scope a little more, and you can see that this spiritual warfare is also a very personal thing. You can see it in your own life when you're tempted with sexual lust, material lust, lust for pride and power. You can see it in malice and prejudice and selfishness. Or sometimes just simply where you need to have your own way. 
And sometimes it shows up like that. Sometimes you can see it in outbursts of anger or acts of vengeance and hostilities. Or maybe you see it when you're tempted to be apathetic to your devotion to God or to the genuine needs of other human beings. That's all spiritual warfare going on. We need to look, whether through a microscope or a telescope, we need to see the accuser at work. And I would suggest three ways that he accuses. First off, he accuses man before God. He says, God, you see what this guy's doing? God, you see what this lady's doing? Something to that effect. Like when he accused Job in the Old Testament before God. Job chapter 1, verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed his work of his hands and his possessions and have increased in the land. Put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. Translate that. Listen, God, this guy Job is only faithful to you. He's only devoted to you when you're really good to him. Give him some hard times and see how he behaves. You'll see what he really is. You see that accusation? And so God responds, and here comes that testing throughout the book of Job to see if Job's devotion to God is sincere and real. And I would assert that this goes on as well in our lives. You know, here's the accusation. This person is a sinner. You have no right to allow this person into heaven because of his sin. And so Satan accuses each one of us before God that way. And you know what? Sometimes Satan is right. Sometimes that's a valid accusation. If your sins are not forgiven. If you are not in a covenant relationship with Christ, that accusation could very well be real. And he tried to accuse Jesus once, at least. In John chapter 14, verse 30. Jesus says to his disciples, I'll not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. That's Satan. He's the one in charge of this abode, this realm. The prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. Translate that. Satan is coming to accuse Jesus before God and look for God's condemnation. But you know what? He hadn't got any claim. No valid accusation at all. I'm not worried about it. Because Jesus was innocent. That's not the case with me. Or you, unless we're in Christ Jesus. Unless our sins are forgiven. We need to be in Christ. So, Satan accuses us before God. But he also accuses God to us. You've heard those accusations. It's uh, Satan. Hey, listen, there is no such thing as God. Have you heard that kind of an accusation? Or so you're going through some hard times. Don't you know that God doesn't care about you? God is powerless. I mean, what kind of a God would allow you to suffer like that? You know, why did God allow my loved one to die? All those accusations are from Satan. And they undermine our trust in God. We need to see where they're coming from. We need to know that they're there from the accuser. And then, third way, the accuser, Satan, he often accuses man before man because he brings division. Didn't you know this one is doing this and this one is guilty of that? And that sort of a thing. Satan's activity is obvious because the results are opposite of what love does. The results of Satan's accusations are opposite of what the Holy Spirit is intended to produce. Satan spreads discord. Satan's accusations spread disunity. But love, Christ, Holy Spirit, they spread unity and harmony. Satan spreads ill will toward other people. Love spreads peace and mercy. Satan spreads suspicions of this person to this person, and love believes all things. Satan assigns evil intentions, but love 
hopes all things. Satan urges you to quit. Love endures all things. Satan is a nitpicker, a fault finder, but love covers a multitude of sins. You see, we can tell the difference. We can see when the accusation is coming from Satan. And Satan's activity is seen in shipwrecked lives. 1 Timothy 1, 18. Timothy, my son, says the Apostle Paul, I give you this instruction in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by following them you may fight the good fight. You see, he's involved in the battle. Holding on to faith with a good conscience, some have rejected these and so have shipwrecked their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. You see the, the struggle going on and what's warring. And, and, and folks who aren't paying attention, their lives get shipwrecked. And you know those, those things. You've seen those kind of things. Somebody appeared to make a Christian commitment and then they fall. And oh, what a fall. And now they spend their time in accusing or gossiping or, or those kinds of things and maybe tearing down instead of building up. And you can see Satan at work in those accusations. The, ac the accuser, call him the night stalker because it's got that kind of a scary sense to it or ought to have. The one who seeks your life is continually trying to ambush you. And as we come to the passage that was read in Revelation chapter 12, the apostle identifies two tools, weapons required to defeat the accuser. First, he mentions the blood of the lamb, verse 11. They overcame him because of the blood of the lamb. We ought to recognize that this is Christ's sacrifice. He shed his blood on the cross. And that sacrifice is key to everything. It, and, and when we talk about the blood of the lamb and this sacrifice of Christ, that's a total encompassing concept of his sacrifice, how the word of God became flesh and dwelt amongst us, how he humbled himself, and, and including his teachings, but including his sacrifice on the cross as well. He willingly gave up his self and shed his blood on our behalf. So Hebrews 9, 14, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? You need to be washed in the blood. You need to have access to that blood. We need, if we're going to overcome Satan, the accuser, we need to have access to the blood of the Lamb. And I would assert that that access comes through baptism. Galatians 3.26, you are all sons of God, or children of God, if you would, through faith in Christ Jesus, for all of you who are baptized into Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ. I want to be clothed with Christ. I want to enter his life. I want to enter that covenant relationship. That's where I'm clothed with Christ, and hence that's where I am put in Christ and have the advantage of the blood of the Lamb. Romans 8, 1, there is there now, therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that baptism, I would assert, is a God-designated ritual in which we call on the name of the Lord. But it's not simply a ritual. It's much more than that. And it, it is a commitment that must be performed in reality. It's not just a, a, a water ceremony, but it is a calling on the name of the Lord, a promising of yourself belonging to the Lord, and appeal to him for a clean conscience. It needs to be a commitment that is made in spirit and in truth. To hold the benefit of the blood of the Lamb, it's necessary to stay in the blood of the Lamb. In other words, to abide in Christ, totally immersed in him. Not just immersed in the water, but totally immersed in Christ and who and what he is. 
And that's where the cleansing is found. That's where the forgiveness is found. So Satan no longer has any legitimate accusation. Right? Look at this sinner, he says. And I can say, but I belong to the Lord. Go to him with that accusation. I am his. I am dead to self. And it's his life that covers me and clothes me and, and his blood in my veins. Totally immersed in him. Hebrews 10.26 says, If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment and a fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. We need to make that commitment legitimate and real with a determination to no longer sin at all, to stay in union with Christ in order to have access and benefit of the blood of the Lamb. And the second item that he appeals to and identifies by which Satan is overcome is the word of their testimony. Once again, verse 11, they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced to death. We have to present a testimony. We have to let God know who we belong to, let people know who we belong to, let Satan know who we belong to. We need to make a testimony that declares whose we are and where we stand. I'm standing on the Lord's side. You know, here's a word of testimony that locates us in the blood of the Lamb and designates our allegiance. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, word of your testimony, Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We need to let folks know where we stand. With Christ Jesus, our testimony of whose we are includes our words, but it also includes our actions. Because the words are empty and no good unless they mean something. The validity of our testimony is seen in our actions. If I say I belong to Christ, I need to show it with my deeds. If I testify he's my Lord, then I need to actually give him charge of my life. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I don't get drunk. I don't participate in gossip or derogatory remarks because I belong to the Lord. That's part of the testimony, right? The words go along with the actions. Our testimony provides other souls with access to the blood of the Lamb because it reveals Christ Jesus, testifies to the fact that we belong to Christ. It's a demonstration of who he is, and it spreads the gospel by who and what we are. And so Peter says in 1 Peter 3, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. They've seen something that makes them ask a question. How can you live with such hope, you see? And so their testimony is seen. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior, think slanderer, think accuser, in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. Your life and your words ought to cause other folks to ask questions and to seek after God in Christ. And these folks, they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, but notice the degree to which they held to that testimony. They held it with their very lives, they did not love their lives so as much as to shrink from death. They were willing to die for the words they spoke that he is Lord. You know, we might be called upon to do that. I don't know what's ahead of us in near years as a nation or as a country, but I see the struggle and the battle raging in worldwide proportions and, and within this nation. Are you prepared to hold to the word of your testimony and not love your lives so much as to shrink from death. We need to be pre prepared to render that kind of a testimony in overcoming the adversary. 
Revelation 2, verse 10 says, Be faithful even to the point of death, and I'll give you the crown of life. I hope you're not called upon to testify to that point, but that's the point we need to hold to. Think of the conflicts and the struggles that you've had this week. Anybody have any spiritual struggles? I'll bet you did. I'll bet some of us struggled trying to get out to church this morning. Maybe there were some irritable snaps, you know. Maybe there were some other ideas of things we wanted to do. All, all kinds of spiritual battles going on because Satan is alive and active and prowling about. Ephesians 6.12 states it plainly. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Folks, two things you need to protect yourself and to overcome Satan. First, rely on the blood of the Lamb. Second, hold to the word of your testimony. In short, be in Christ and make sure everybody knows it. Pray with me. Father, we do praise your name. We do submit our lives to you. Father, move us and draw us closer to you and help us to be immersed in Christ. If we're not in covenant relationship, move us to that covenant relationship that we can belong to you. We make that commitment to you. Enable us, help us, and give us that faith and that courage to hold to our commitment to you in word and in deed. In the name of Christ, amen. <clears throat> we are here with the biblical intention of being a strength and an encouragement to one another. So it may be that you're struggling somehow. It may be that you need prayers. It may be that you need somebody to step alongside of you and help you physically in some way or spiritually. But we are here to be a strength to one another. If we can serve you and encourage you and enable you, if may the God, the Spirit of God work through us as we strengthen and encourage one another. If you have needs, now is a time. Raise your hand or come forward and we pray together or... If you're bashful to do that, catch somebody before you leave the building. Amen. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong in the strength which God Yeah.